Hey there! For the next couple of videos, I'm actually going to do something a little different. I recently returned from a coven retreat with my working partner slash coven sister, and during which time, we went ahead and recorded a conversation we decided to have for the explicit purpose of putting up on my channel about working together in coven about the experience of coming from two distinct, strong, personal practices and having those meld together over the course of a year to create a strong group practice. Since, all told, this conversation was fairly long, I'm going to be splitting it up into a couple of videos. Therefore, without further ado, welcome to the conversation at the Coven Retreat. I hope you guys enjoy. So thank you for inviting me. It's so delightful to join your famous YouTube channel. I've been hearing, I'm not on so YouTube. So famous. <laughs> I am not on YouTube, but I've been hearing about this from her and I've watched several of her videos and I'm so supportive and excited about it. So yay. Thank yay. you for having me on. <laughs> um, so my story is I have been practicing for about 20 years. I quite literally fell into witchcraft in college. I had a um, work-study job shelving books at the campus library, and one day a book leapt from the shelf as I was reshelving books, smacked me on the foot. The title was Living in the Lap of the Goddess, and as a ardent feminist who was raised in a conservative Christian home who had been desperately searching for spirituality who made sense to her, um, the Divine Feminine took hold pretty quickly, and I've been goddess-focused ever since. My training over the years has included a lot of book learning because when I first fell into it, it was the mid-90s, and the internet didn't really exist, so a lot of book learning, a lot of solitary practice, but I have also been a member of several different groups, covens. I've done uh, considerable study in green witchcraft. I've apprenticed with a green witch. I have my Reiki master training, and I'm currently mentoring with a wonderful intuitive coach. So I take my practice very seriously. It's a lifelong course of study for me, and it's a, honestly one of the most important aspects of my life. Delightful. Well, I'm super happy to be doing this while we are off at our coven retreat in beautiful Maine. Middle of nowhere, Maine. Middle of nowhere. It took us forever to get here, but it's beautiful. <laughs> okay, so we wanted to talk about this topic of what it's like to come from a strong individual personal practice to working in a group, to coven work, and what that really looks like for somebody who has a strong and dedicated personal practice and who is beginning or joining a coven that is not your typical BTW hierarchical structured coven with its own strong traditions, but in fact creating something new. Exactly. So I have been part of more traditional covens in the past and often what that practice looked like was everybody sort of operating from the same playbook. So the structure, everything from the structure of the ritual to how it informed one's personal practice was rather unified. And at this point in my practice, I'm 39, I've been doing this for more than 20 years, and at this point in my practice, I was really looking for an opportunity to build, grow, and maintain my personal practice, but also come together in a group dynamic to learn and grow with each other, to celebrate um, on the holidays, um, but also to find new depth and new avenues of exploration that would function both within that group dynamic as well as inform my personal practice. Yeah, so as you know, this was my first coven experience. And what I particularly liked about, and do like still, about the way it's turned out is the fact that I have not sacrificed any aspect of my personal work and the coven identity has incorporated my personal spiritual identity into it. We have built something out of our component practices 
and in that way expanded, you know, our individual practices. Certainly my individual practice has been informed by our coven work now. And I think that there's this constant push and pull between what's going on with me personally and what's going on with us as a coven. So my path has been altered by it, but my path hasn't been devoured or subsumed by it. I would agree with that. And I think, too, what's been particularly exciting and illuminating for me is seeing how, although our paths have been running parallel in many ways, every time we hit a point of intersection where our paths reach a convergence, there is divine guidance there. There's always a major takeaway or a major aha moment for us as a coven that has ripple effects in our personal practices. And that to me has been, you know, the greatest source of shared magic, as well as such a strong reminder or guidepost that this was meant to happen. We were meant to come together in community, in group, to grow our practices both separately and jointly. Yeah, I think it's interesting that throughout the course of our working together, it seems like we've often been and found ourselves on opposite sides of the same coin. Our paths are different enough that these themes and concepts manifest differently in our individual personal practices, but it seems like we have been, again, crossing paths repeatedly, and there tends to be an overarching theme to our individual journeys that has come together to create what it is we focus on as a coven, what it is we pursue and become very interested in doing as a group. So we come to the table with different views, different experiences, different ways of conceptualizing what we're doing. So can you explain? I mean, they're pretty familiar with how I do shit. <laughs> but I'd love for you to also communicate how you do shit, because I think one of the big concerns when people are approaching the idea of covens and how to create a group with other people who may have quite different practices, they sort of feel like if we're not on the same page with all of these things, it can never work. And I think we're pretty strong evidence that that's not the case. For sure. I mean, I think as unique as each of our practices and paths are, we share many of the same core values. And I would stress, you know, for anybody that's considering working in group, that that's a critical component, right? You and I have the same politics. We have a lot of the same belief structures. We're both coming um, at the work from a feminist perspective. There's a lot of shared ideology and ethics that for me would have to be there to be able to work magically with someone else. Mm -hmm. You know, that's just a non negotiable There's certain things that are non-negotiable, right? Yeah. So for your subscribers out there, that's one thing I want to just kind of lay down as a foundation as to why this does work for us, mm -hmm. is that at the core of what we believe in, we have shared values. And I feel like that's incredibly important for anybody that's willingly stepping into a situation where you're going to make magic with someone else. It's very, mm -hmm. obviously, intention is all, and it's very important to believe in the same things from a, from a core value standpoint. So, But again, I think that, yes, I fully agree with that. I also think it's important to distinguish between core values, core beliefs, core interests, and mechanistic details, particular For sure. perspectives, where I think a lot of people get hung up when that isn't really, I mean, it's useful from a personal development and an intellectual standpoint. It can be really handy and developing your own paradigm by which you believe things are operating and you think you can make your work more effective using these paradigms that's great but the people you work with don't have to share the same mechanistic viewpoints correct provided that you're on the same page 
from a what is my intention, what is my goal, what am I trying to get out of it in terms of the identity that the group ends up possessing. I'm shaking my head vigorously. You can't see that, but I'm doing it. Um, I agree. <laughs> she means nodding. <laughs> <laughs> I agree very much with what with what she's saying there. From a mechanistic standpoint, her approach, as you know from following her videos, is I refer to her as a master craftsperson. The craft that she brings to the craft, haha, pun intended. <laughs> um, is really at the forefront of her practice. It's very, very important to her. Um, The tools that she uses, the approach that she takes, the specificity and intention that she imbues into everything that she creates and crafts as part of her practice is hugely important to her. I respect that tremendously. I benefit from that tremendously and that she brings a lot of this (laughs) into circle, which uh, you know, she is a master craftsperson. I am a master appreciator of good <laughs> craftsmanship. I'm more like, I, to be completely honest with you guys, I'm much more likely to buy something and use it in my practice or forage it or get it from another source. Um, the actual creation of the thing um, is not as integral to my practice as it is to hers, but because she loves to create, and I'm such an appreciator and enjoyer of that. It's actually a really <laughs> wonderful thing. Match made. It in. is. It's a match made in heaven. <laughs> it's sort of like, yes, because I, I really love artists and things. Um, I would say in a similar way where we sort of diverge, she is incredibly intentional and thoughtful and I would say pretty regimented in how you approach your practice on a day-to-day basis. I take a much more sort of ebb and flow approach in that, you know, there are days where I'm just sort of all consumed in my practice and I'm eat, sleeping and breathing it truly. And then there are days where I will go, you know, I'll go several days without even pulling a tarot card. So it just, it's much less regimented in my world. And I operate much more from a place of sort of divine inspiration. So I'm also, um, I also work as a professional tarot reader and energy clearer, um, doing work in in homes and businesses. Um, And I'm also a medium. So For me, when spirit comes knocking and says, hey, we, you know, you're being called to do X, Y, or Z, I leap and go do it. Um, I'm very, very much, my practice itself is very, very much guided by what spirit is asking of me on any given day, how I'm spiritually or divinely guided to do the work. That is the structure of my practice. And so it looks very different day to day, depending on what's being asked of me. For me, my practice is very much being of service to the greater good. So if someone comes to me in need and it feels aligned to me, if I check in with my guides and I feel like, yes, this is in highest and best alignment for me to go be of service and to help this individual or this family, I will go do it because it feels much more like a calling sometimes than a practice. And the mechanical details of that ebb and flow and change and evolve based on what spirit is asking of me at any given time. Is that what you were getting at? Yeah, that's great. And actually, again, it brings up a really interesting point that you are clearly, of the two of us, much more, and have been since I've known you, much more comfortable with the intuitive leap, with taking a message and running with it, with what some people would characterize as faith and willingness to be open. My particular analytic perspective in many ways developed within my personal practice as a response to the fact that I have a very hard time making that leap. So having spent some time now working with you, I can draw from your capacity to do that and have as a result become much more comfortable with moving in that sort of direction. It has really served to help me figure out how I really feel and think about some of these things. 
there is a great deal that you do and a great deal that you incorporate and focus on that is a core aspect of your practice that is not something that belonged within my personal practice. And over the time that I've known you, I have softened a lot of those boundaries. And again, not because it required giving up on an analytical approach, but rather because I learned how to really appreciate the significance of something without having to understand the details of how it comes about, why it is, right? I can. I learned to make larger intuitive leaps with you, and that's something that I've brought out of our shared practice into my own practice even though my own practice remains one that's built on a foundation of a fairly analytic approach, I am definitely much more willing to run with the perceptual experiences that beforehand I might have been more likely to dismiss as being unimportant because there was no mechanistic room for their existence in my practice. And now I don't dismiss them, even though mechanistically, I don't have an explanation for why I experience the details of what is going on. Mm -hmm. No, I'm yet again, nodding vigorously. Um, <laughs> no, I think this is, we've stumbled into a very sort of interesting dialogue that we've actually never had in real life before right Not now. Not explicitly, no. But I think... What's interesting is your willingness to go with me on some of those points is because, and this is another point that I would share with your subscribers, we have enough shared language um, in that we're both academics. Mm -hmm. um, she obviously, as you all know, comes from a scientific background. I come from an arts background. And so even just in the way that we approach our academic interests, right, it's yeah. Between the two of us, magic, or the practice of witchcraft, is both an art and a science. And we each sort of represent complementary aspects of that. Our understanding of that, our appreciation for that, our study of that in our professional lives, our personal lives, outside of our practice even, I think influences the way we approach the work together, but also creates mutual respect. I am not a scientist. But I have great appreciation for the mechanistic work that you bring to the table based on, frankly, the way your brain is wired, <laughs> the, the, way, the way that you approach life in general, right? But I also think because we are each very well studied in our own regards, there's just a mutual level of respect. And mm -hmm. I don't need Absolutely. to exactly understand what you're doing or why you're doing it. I appreciate and respect and can learn from it. And similarly, it's like, you're never going to truly understand the way my wacky brain is wired and the way that I experience the divine through a faith-based mechanism, right? right? But it's enough that you respect me as a person and as a witch Absolutely. that we're able to have the conversation. Yeah, and I think that's a key concept, the idea yeah. of if you can respect the person you're working with enough to be willing to run with them, follow their lead down an avenue that you wouldn't necessarily venture to on your own. That is both, you know, a very good sign from a should you work with this person standpoint, and also an amazing opportunity to expand your own understanding of your practice, of the craft, expand your turf regarding what you're comfortable working in, what you're comfortable doing, how you're comfortable approaching stuff. There are, there are directions that you have led me that I would never go um, on my own or never would have gone on my own. There are absolutely areas where I discovered they were significant areas of interest and work in your personal practice, and they were very outside of my zone of comfort I was relying entirely on the, well, it's you. I don't doubt for a second that there's something going on there. I'm willing to follow your lead boss in this area and see what happens. And I think that having basically a native guide yes. into areas that you're not used to is something that having a coven or group-based approach can really provide. That isn't necessarily always spoken about when you have these hyper-structured hierarchical 
very fixed, already embedded traditions, this isn't necessarily a super obvious advantage of working in a group. But when you're creating something from scratch with different viewpoints and mindsets, this is something that materially is incredibly beneficial and important. I don't know, you know, for shit what it is you're doing here, but I can follow you into this area knowing that you know enough are comfortable enough that this is her if I can explore taking your lead. Absolutely. And that for me is where the alchemy occurs, right? Where you're bringing disparate perspectives, when you're bringing differential kinds of strengths to the same practice, to a shared group ritual. And, you know, I always sort of default to the tarot archetype. So for me, it's the lover's card, right? It's this integration of disparate pieces of what turns out to be one whole. And that's the other interesting thing is that we are here, we're on retreat right now. It's been about almost a year since we've been working together. And when we first started this journey, it was pretty amorphous. We kind of weren't really sure <laughs> yeah. what we would really be focused on. You know, we knew we wanted to be in community and in shared ritual, but beyond that, we really weren't sure what the through line was going to look like. Yeah. It's taken us nearly a year, and it literally, truly happened today. Yes. So, the <laughs> treat has just been a shit show of... <laughs> sort of significant <laughs> events that have thrown both of us for a loop where, you know that moment when you look back and you're like, it okay, here's what it feels like. It is a spiritual equivalent of getting to the end of an Agatha Christie novel where now all of a sudden you can look back and you're like, that was a clue and that was a clue and that was a clue and here was a red herring and that was definitely a clue. And now that you're, you know, the hindsight is twenty twenty because you know who the God is. Right. Like. Right. Right. And so we had this moment today of realizing we have been being guided down a shared path the entire time. And most of the time it felt like two disparate paths that would occasionally converge. Mm -hmm. But in truth, um, where our group work is really being directed. And we now have plans to rededicate our group work at, which is essentially the year anniversary, mm -hmm. um, toward this shared purpose that, frankly, is a perfect marriage of art and science. Yes. And the way we're talking about it. Even just earlier today as we were brainstorming key words and themes that are going to be integral components of this new circle, even the way that was happening was this perfect blend of art and science. So it's really exciting. We never would have gotten to this point had we not taken the journey that mm -hmm. we took. Yeah. And, <laughs> right? And so, again, we've been working together for a year. And over the course of that year, I mean, we've worked together regularly for Circle. At least twice a month. And basically for the entire evening, we have spent a good chunk of time together. And over the course of that year, we didn't necessarily have a master plan. Things were just sort of happening. We were getting to know one another. We were letting our paths carry us. And where we intersected, we intersected. But I think that's also an interesting point. There's a fundamental difference between jumping into a tradition and then creating something new with somebody else of like mind or a group of like mind. And it's the kind of thing that matures organically. So the idea that you have to come into it knowing exactly what you want your group to be or knowing exactly what form it's going to take that is not necessarily always in the cards. And there's nothing wrong with just being like, okay, here's what's going to happen. We're going to get together. We're going to talk about our paths. We're going to circle. We're going to do this kind of ritual. We're going to celebrate this sort of holiday. And, you know, seeing what comes of it. Now looking back, we can see all of the little components that came together to create what is going on now but there was no plan regarding where we wanted to end up there was only like here is what i want to experience when we get together and where we go is something that will happen right and i think i, I think i might have been a little more comfortable with that from the get-go in that i do tend to operate on well divine is going to guide right we're going to ask for guidance and divine will come through and sort of direct our hand you know 
I will say too, having been part of more traditional covens in the past, one thing that always felt a little hollow to me was that sort of coming to the table with, all right, we've scripted out the ritual. This is what we're going to do and say when, and this is your role, and this is your role. And in a larger group, and when you are operating in, under a more formalized tradition, I understand why that's the case, but it truly, it wasn't for me. In the same way, growing up, the Christian church wasn't for me. You know, and I sat there every Sunday and kept waiting to feel something and never did. That was often how I felt in previous covens, where, well, this is what I say I believe, I should be feeling something, but this doesn't actually feel authentic to me. And because we gave each other permission to just show up in our authentic selves, here's what's going on in my practice, here's what's going well, here's what I'm struggling with, you know, will you read for me? Like, how would you like to celebrate this holiday? Here's what I've done traditionally. What have you done? Let's come up with a new tradition together. You know, it was mm -hmm. so organic and so in service to the work we were doing <laughs> that it became a support and sort of almost like added nourishment mm -hmm. to the work we were already doing versus something that pulled us from our paths or pulled or distracted us in any way. It was much more value added than it was separate. Absolutely. I think, so it's not obviously always going to be the case with a more traditional practice that's more well-defined, that has a more structured layout, but in some cases it can be the difference between feeling like an interchangeable cog versus feeling like a key foundation of the group, right? For sure. And what's hilarious about this is where we're actually being led is to now develop a more formalized tradition that is uniquely ours. So we were talking earlier today about incorporating chant, incorporating a more structured ritual where we have a section of the work that we do together really focused on the call, what we're being called to do in this, in this new identity of our coven. So this will be a whole new chapter for us. It's kind of ironic that we started from this very freeform place thinking that's what we wanted, and now we're actually being directed more into a formalized structure, but it's one that's uniquely ours. It's one that we are scripting based on what we've learned over the past year and what's been divinely revealed to us. The other thing is this, the level of organic, unstructured practice that we share together is much less structured than my personal practice, mm. right? I have obviously unlimited flexibility alone. I can do anything I want as a solitary. And as a solitary, I gravitate towards a certain kind of structure. And it's one that's based upon engaging in actions, engaging in spoken words. And one of the interesting things with our practice when we circle together is how little focus there was on not just the specific overarching structure, but on specific ritualized actions or specific ritualized words. We don't vocally cast circle. We don't vocally invoke deity. We don't vocally do many of these things. We're both sort of working independently in circle and with a few exceptions where we have a particular ritual goal that involves saying something out loud, by and large we're sort of both working in tandem silently together, which is even quite different from my own personal mm. practice. And so now we're moving from what is much more free form and less structured back into closer territory for me. It's, it's funny that you bring that up because our shared rituals are much more structured than my own practice. <laughs> yeah, of course they are. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking um, artists. No, right? <laughs> right? I know. It's, it's so funny. Um, but I will say that I do, in my own personal practice, practice. And again, I have a lot of time and space and solitude when I practice and I could be dancing around naked around a fire and no one would know. But I do tend to do most of my work in silence, in my mind. The way I connect to spirit is often through images that I see with my eyes closed or through words or phrases that I sort of hear in my mind, right? It doesn't require me to be vocal or mechanistic in order to receive the wisdom mm -hmm. that I've asked for, the guidance that I've asked for. 
that being said, I feel like our work together has encouraged me and inspired me to be a little more structured and a little more ritualistic in my work than I typically would have been. Mm -hmm. Oh, another point I wanted to make is despite the fact that we work in silence for the majority of, well, I would say for our entire circle casting, for our opening and closing of our rituals, we tend to work in silence. When we first started a year ago, I don't even think you know this. I don't think we've ever been talked about this, but <laughs> we first started over a year I'm ago. I'm editing this, just so you know. Okay, go on. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, this is, this is, I think, a good story. When we started working together over a year ago and we would do our silent invocations, I would finish in like two minutes and I'd open my eyes and there she'd be like physically pulling energy from the earth with her hands. And I could tell she was like still at like the first of the four corners, you know? <laughs> and I would sit there and watch for a solid 10, 15 minutes. Oh, shit. Being like, <laughs> wow, she really has. And, and again, going back to mechanistic, you know, there were certain phrases and words and invocations that you were doing even in your mind, right, to mm -hmm. walk you through the process that was identical to your home practice. What is so fantastic and magical is, and I realized this at the last ritual we did just last month, we are now at a point where we have so converged that now our opening and closing are within seconds of each other. Like we are sitting there in silence with our eyes closed. I will open my eyes and within seconds of doing that, she opens her eyes. We have totally synced our timing now. Mm -hmm. And it's somewhere in the middle. It's probably about seven minutes now. Yeah. Where yours used to be 15 and mine was two. Now we're both around <laughs> seven, I think. And that is a beautiful synchronicity that happened completely without our forcing it to have like we never had a conversation about this we never like it no. just it happened organically naturally with time we sort of right. yeah converged there were right. things okay so one thing I did notice I don't use the same approach as when I work alone I don't have to sacrifice the stuff that's important when I work alone but it is a slightly tweaked slightly different version that I use when I am in circle with you there are different things that I focus on specifically. And part of that is also feeling like there are specific tones and concepts that I feel work better with us together mm. in circle, mm. right? There are things that I will do when I'm alone, but I don't feel the need to do when we're circling together. Even our approach to sacred space, the geographic layout of what we're constructing is different when we're working together than working alone. And so the brackets, the supports that I sort of use when I'm building sacred space with you are different now. There are slightly different approaches. I probably still do that. Like I still, I'm sure, do the reaching down. <laughs> and that is, that is sort of my my approach. Okay, so if you want to know what I'm doing when I do that, okay, so <laughs> you're about to learn something that you may or may not care about. But anyways, we're talking about this because this is actually a conversation that you're just being subject to. <laughs> so actually what I'm doing with that is the way I call sacred space, the way I build a circle. Do you remember we had that conversation where I, I do this sort of realm jumping? Yes. Right. So there's like reflected me, right, in this sort of alternate astral mental realm. When I reach down and pull up, I feel resistance when I pull up, almost like there are little webs attached to my hands, right? So I sort of reach down for that energy and pull up. And in my mind, I'm simultaneously doing that in the astral realm. And between the two iterations of me, when I build enough of that resistance and I pull up, I'm like dragging the circle up from the ground up where I am in the material realm and then the astral realm simultaneously pulling that down. So I'm making like a split sphere between the physical and astral realms. And I feel it as a physiological sensation, but that's why I do this like sort of floating hand thing by my sides where I reach down, on the exhale and on the inhale, I draw up. And what's, <laughs> no, I mean, what is so, there's so much synchronicity here because my practice of how I raise energy 
is actually kind of similar, and we've never really talked about this, but I operate through a chakra system, so I'm pulling up energy from the center of the earth through my chakra system, starting at the root. And I also experience it as a physical sensation. So as the energy is moving through my body and it's spiraling around each chakra, I actually feel that energetic pull. And for me, and again, so much of what I do is third eye work um, and crown chakra work, when the energy reaches my third eye and my crown chakra, Typically, the physical sensation of it is so overwhelmingly strong that often what happens is my whole head tips back with it. Mm -hmm. And then it, it explodes out the crown chakra, and that's what creates my sphere, my protective sphere around me. So, again, different approaches, but actually sort of a similar end point. And the fact that we both experience it as a physical sensation is a shared practice that we've actually never even talked about, but have been doing yeah. all along. Yeah. And in fact, that reminds me, I will be at some point making a video on the somatic manifestation of spiritual experience. Of course she is. Of course she's going to do that. Because <laughs> it's an awesome topic, first off. <laughs> Secondly, I am very distinctly weird in the level of somatic manifestation I experience from spiritual events. She is. She's got some real tales about this to share with y'all. <laughs> I should probably sit in on that one, too, just so I can be like, yeah, I remember when that happened. Yeah. That, that shit was really weird. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Okay. My, gonna, there's going to be some oversharing, possibly, in that one. No, but that's, yeah, that's a super, that's a super interesting topic. Mine is a lot more mundane. You know, typically for me, I'll get a headache or I'll feel really depleted, like I need to be sort of fed, you know, or I'll need rest. <laughs> Um, but this, my, the great spiritual crafty hangover. Totally. I've totally had those. Um, most recently there was a night, I guess it was a month or so ago. I uh, ended up giving 19 tarot readings in one day, <laughs> which I thought I was totally <laughs> fine. And then I stood up to leave and it was as if I'd had four bottles of whiskey um, I was so messed up and I needed to go for Reiki and do all kinds of things to sort of replenish myself. But my experiences in that regard have been a lot more typical, whereas hers manifest in the most unusual ways I've ever seen. Truth. Yeah, it's, it's a special experience. Sorry, I'm just refilling wine glasses. Important. <laughs> it is key. Critical importance here at the Coven Retreat. And I think that's a pretty good place to cut it off. As ever, I welcome any questions or comments you may have, and we'll try to get back to you in a more or less timely fashion. I hope our little exchange was insightful, maybe helped provide one perspective of how groups can come together and what's important in forming one. And of course, until next time, I wish you a most wonderful day.